welcome to episode 10. Over 900 downloads. It's a milestone, Julian. Well, a thousand downloads will be, certainly. So we've got to maintain... And we're still together. We're, we're still, still alongside each other. We are, we are, we are. Um, so we've got to maintain the high standard. Today, you're going to help me plan my next US trip. That's right. We're going to talk about where have all the workers gone in both the UK and the US. And in education, you're going to... I'm going to talk about different cliques, the different groups in the US education system. So nerds and jocks and outcasts, all of those type of things. Okay. And my children are going to continue to help me. So in this section, we're going to help Michael plan his next vacation to the US. Obviously, at the moment, you can't enter the US because you're not allowed to uh, due to COVID rules. But at some point, those COVID rules will relax. What's your overall thinking in terms of your next vacation, Michael? You know, when, roughly where, what things does it have to have in it? Okay. And before I do, um, one of my good friends tells me there is a uh, way you can get into the US. There is. Uh, yes. If you go to NASA and you isolate for two weeks, right. and there are worse places to spend your isolation, you can then go into the States. Is that Actually, true? It, it's most places in the Caribbean or Mexico. You can travel there, you can spend two weeks there, and once you've had two weeks there, you can then go into the US. But many people don't have the time to do that. So at the moment, USA is off limits. I imagine over the next couple of months, that will change. But until then, we're planning with a little bit of uncertainty. Okay. So um, what I'm thinking about, Julian, is that I want to follow the advice of Matthew Woodward and his excellent book, Silver Streak. Um, this is not another railway thing, it, is it's it? It's another oh railway thing. God. You know how I like railways. The really secret of this one, it's not only a long journey. These trains have dining cars. They so do. Dining and sleeping, cars. And sleeping cars as yep, well. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so we get a chance to meet lots of other Americans or people traveling in the States. Right. So the game plan is mm -hmm. that we'll fly into LA. Right. And we'll take the Silver Streak through to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm then thinking we will drive to Miami. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have driven previously from Miami to New England. New Orleans, so we may need a different Where's route. That again? New Orleans, New okay. Orleans, not like Chattanooga, but we're getting there. Uh, and then, of course, following an early episode of ours, Julian, and your highly recommendation of going to the Keys. Right. So that's what I want to do. We did have a conversation as we planned this podcast as to when is the best time. Right. What's your thoughts on that, Julian? Well, assuming that you're allowed in, I think there are two times which I think would be good times. So November, December time frame, I think would be an excellent time. If you spent some time in Texas, which is what I'm going to suggest you do, then you can see some great uh, college and high school football, which I think is marvellous. And it's also a good and slightly off-season time in Florida. And then the second time is January through to March. Potentially, you could be in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. January to March is peak season for Florida. Those are the two times which I think are, which are good. I think beyond that, as you get into the summer months, many of those places are just too hot to travel in. Not before November, because you want to avoid the hurricanes in Florida. But between November and March, great time to do that journey. So let's start with the advice then. So LA, episode three, we talked about LA. So go and re revisit that bit of the podcast to find out you know, what we talked about in terms of things that you would do. I guess you would have a few days in LA before you took the train? Not sure. Might fly in and go out the next day. Okay. Remember, LA is not my favourite place. No, but your wife likes it. Yeah. I did actually take the opportunity to talk to your wife about she, what she would like to do on this vacation, and possibly something you've overlooked. But uh, she said that she really would like to go back to Santa Monica. Okay. Maybe she said Malibu uh, as well. But, you know, there are a lot of those beachy places on LA. I would strongly recommend Balboa Island and Newport Beach. A couple of days just to acclimatize yourself to the new time zone. If you want to see a national park, the Channel Islands, which is just off Santa Barbara, just north of LA, a great thing to do. Your wife expressed an interest 
to go to the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which was designed by Frank Gehry, or indeed the Frank Lloyd Wright houses, of which there are three in LA. Plenty of things to do. And I think your wife is expecting to spend a bit of time in LA. Okay, okay then, so uh, if I followed Matthew's advice, when, yes. and Matthew, I should point out, it's a little bit like you, Julian, is also a movie and TV buff. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm. When he went to LA, he specifically sought out Paradise Cove. Now, oh, yes. I love that. Why? Because and, and you, you know why? Rockford Files. Yes, that's right. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, for those people who've watched the Rockford Files, the 1970s, TV show, which was uh, very popular in the UK, Jim Rockford had a, a mobile home, a caravan on Paradise Cove, which isn't there anymore. But what is there? There's a great restaurant there, uh, which is right on the beach. Uh, and I highly recommend that. That's in Malibu. So highly recommend that you go to that, uh, that place. You'll recognize the beach and, and the various things there. But Sadly, no caravan. And I think there is a blue plaque, but there's also a blue plaque because I think it's also the the place where they photograph the Beach Boys' pet sounds. Ah. Oh. Do you know, only one of the Beach Boys was able to surf. No, surely it's true. It's true. Only one of them was able to surf. And uh, he was also, Dennis, was also the, one, the only one to drown. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an irony. There's an irony uh, there. in that. I mean, the thing about L.A. is that everywhere has appeared in a film or TV show. In Malibu, there's, and I forget the name now of the place, there's a park there, which was where MASH was filmed. So all of the episodes of MASH were filmed there, and you can walk to some of the set, which is still there, even though that was filmed in the 1970s. Okay. So, so you've convinced me we need at least two or three days. Yeah, a, a couple of days just to get over the jet lag and enjoy some of the things. Have some beaches in California and then some beaches in, in Florida and compare them. You know, you're going to take this train, aren't you, to New Orleans? It, it, you know it takes two days to yep. get to New Orleans. Yep. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that you get off halfway there. So you have a day on the train. You get off at either Midland, Texas or Sanderson, Texas. And you take a few days in West Texas. And I think there are some terrific things to do there. The first is to go to Big Bend National Park which is a stunning national park on the Mexican border. It hugs the Rio Grande. While you're there, you will realize why it is impossible to build a wall between Mexico and the USA. But it is absolutely stunning countryside and strongly recommend it. I would also recommend that you go to a town called Marfa, Texas. So most Texan towns are as you probably imagine them completely sort of desolate and hundreds of miles from the next town. And this one is no exception. But this has become a, a mecca for installation art and contemporary art. They have transformed this town into, in, into a place for people who love art, like your, your wife particularly, uh, modern art. I would suggest you stay at a hotel there called Hotel Paisano, which is the best hotel in town. And if you're so inclined, go and see the Marfa Lights, which is something which they're trying to pretend is a little bit like the Northern Lights. But that's a great place to spend a, a night and in, enjoy the art on show in that town. Do you like stars? Yes, yeah. Most of the world, most of the developed world, has light pollution. Yes. Most people now can't see the Milky Way. There's too much light pollution from nearby towns and so forth. Uh, but that part of Texas is what they call dark. And, and they have the biggest observatory there. And they have uh, a few evenings a week you can go along and you can be educated about the stars. And how far is it from the train station, we're, we're telling as we stop, to this place? Uh, a couple of hundred miles, maybe a hundred okay. miles. hundred miles maximum, probably. So I need actually. to have a car. There's no public transport. Okay. Yeah, you need, to, you need to rent a car. If you've got a bit of time, there's a nice town there called Marathon. Uh, and a great hotel called the Gage Hotel. But that is, it's a stunning area, and you definitely wouldn't regret some time in, in that sort of desolate part of Texas. One of the interesting features, when you go to Big Bend Park, they don't really have border police where the border is, but they do have border police 60 miles up the road. So as you go through that border going north, 
your car will be stopped and they will check in every alcove in your car to check that you're not bringing any illegal immigrants with you. Okay. It's roughly halfway, so you'd have to take a day. I think it leaves in the evening from LA. It arrives in Texas, you know, around about the evening. The next day, it would be another 24 hours until you got to New Orleans. So New Orleans, which I think you've been to, haven't you? We have, we have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously you've got Bourbon Street and all this jazz and drink. And I'm, I'm not. Is it really your thing, Bourbon Street? Not really, no. no I mean, it doesn't really do champagne, does it? No, it's more. No, no. And obviously, if you went in Mardi Gras time, you know, wherever that is next year, February, March, I mean, that would be a very drunken affair indeed. Yeah. The French Quarter, which is absolutely beautiful, yep. which you've probably been to. And we stayed in last time. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So maybe this time, stay in the Garden District. Okay. Which is another very pleasant area of New Orleans. They've got a new museum uh, since you were there called the World War II Museum. My wife will attest to the fact that I've seen every World War II museum in the world. Well, it's not true, but that's what she thinks. But I think that's really one of the best. Uh, they've done a tremendous job. What they do is, as you arrive, they assign you an identity of somebody of American GI going to war. And then you follow that identity in the relevant points you know, you could be a poor boy from the south who's just fodder for, for infantry, or you could be, uh, you know, an officer, or you could be a dog. Uh, and you follow that person's experience yeah. during the war, and, and other people, you know, in your party do that as well. In particular, I think the war in the Pacific section, there's two sections of the museum, Europe and Pacific. The Pacific section is terrific. Great museum. And you need to allow... I think I spent a day there at that museum. Great okay. museum. Have you done a swamp tour there? No, no, I didn't. Okay, so you can do a swamp tour, although you may prefer to do the one in the Everglades yep. in Florida. Have you done the steamboat Natchez? We did. Yes. yes, we did that one. Going up the Mississippi. Yeah. And would you do that again? No. No, okay. Actually, Natchez, which is a town uh, quite a few hours north of New Orleans in Mississippi, that is a... A great town to visit. You really see the faded excellence there was, you know, pre-Civil War days. They're a great town. Now, sadly, quite poor, but you can see the fantastic plantation houses and other houses there. But that's probably off your way, so I won't suggest going to Natchez. can be another trip. Your wife likes art, so okay. there's the New Orleans Museum of Art, which is excellent, and there's the Ogden Southern Art Museum as well both of which are fantastic museums for those people who like art. Okay. Did you have any thoughts on New Orleans? Well, it's more of a how to get there. Um, mm -hmm. I have driven from New Orleans to Miami. Mm -hmm. And that time, that took us sort of two, three days stopping at Tallahassee right. and Mobile. Okay. Would you recommend this time flying from New Orleans to Miami, or do you think the road trip is essential? given it's going to take another two, two and a half days to get there. My suggestion on my piece of paper here says that you should stop at Tallahassee in Biloxi. All right. <laughs> so I would suggest if you've done that trip already, the coast between New Orleans and the west coast of Florida, you've got Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and then going into Florida, there's mainly beach. And it depends which time of year you're going. But a lot of that is beach, which is out of season. I think what I would propose that you do is that you fly to Tampa and you rent an open top car yeah. in Tampa and then you drive down that west coast of Florida okay. and then across to Miami and then down to the Keys. Yes. And I would suggest you do that. The one-way fees within Florida will be a lot less than the one-way drop-off fee from New Orleans to the Keys. So if you've done that road before, give yourself more time in Florida, give yourself more time in New Orleans and Texas. That, but, that will be my but suggestion. But go down the east coast of, of Florida? No, west coast. West coast of Florida is what I'm suggesting okay. to you. Okay, so there are adherents to the east coast yeah. of Florida. I love the west coast of Florida. Okay. When we eventually settle down, we will settle down on the west coast of Florida. Okay. Wonderful beaches, very relaxed attitude. I'm proposing to send you down that west okay. coast. Okay, so so that means we'll probably go to St. Petersburg, will we? And 
Say it the Don Cesar, my wife's favourite, Pink Palace. If you wish to do yeah. that, then do that. I was actually going to suggest you go to Anna Maria Island. Okay. Uh, down the west coast of Florida, initially these were all islands. And they don't look like islands today because they've got bridges and lots of roads and things which are joining them. And it, it, you don't think that you're on island, but they were all originally independent islands. And there's a bunch of islands from Anna Maria down to Cap Tiva and Sanibel and beyond. And I would, would suggest that you go and you see some of those. And I would start at the northernmost one of those islands called Anna Maria Island, which the beaches are perfect there. It's a fantastic place. Originally, that was where we were going to live, but it has just become too touristy. People have moved out and it's really just become a place where people go on vacation. You are on vacation, so I would suggest you go there. Uh, but if not there, Longboat Key or Siesta Key or Venice. Venice is a really attractive place along that coast. I would spend a few days uh, in a beach environment enjoying the sun and the experiences of Florida. Either I would rent a boat and take the boat out myself, or if you didn't have that bravery to do that, then rent a captain for a day and go out deep sea fishing. Enjoy that wonderful experience in Florida of being in the ocean or on the water catching fish. I have a vision of my wife struggling with that, <laughs> catching a fish, but you don't think she'd be able to catch a fish or you don't think she would like to catch a fish? I don't think she'd like to catch a fish. Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, then don't do the fishing thing and just rent a boat. Yeah. Make sure it's a good day. Sarasota Bay and Tampa Bay are things of absolute wonder. The size of these bays are enormous. Tampa Bay is a little bit more difficult. I would suggest you start with Sarasota Bay, a good day, and you can navigate yourself, rent a boat for a day, and navigate yourself between places to eat, a place for lunch, a place for dinner, Gosh. and go and explore. So Florida, you have the coast, and then you have these islands. So in between, you've got, you've got the bay side. So you've got all of these houses, and you can do this thing of just going alongside these houses, figuring out which one you would buy if only you had tons of money. And that's the thing which uh, you know, my wife and I enjoy doing, and I'm sure you would enjoy it as well. It's a little bit like Hollywood Hills. You can probably get these maps which tell you where all the famous people live. You can go fairly close to their house and see the lap of luxury that they live in. If you haven't done the... Yeah, you had a comment? I was going to, I was going to just go back to Tallahassee. Yes. Um, because um, I need to tell you my story of, of the visit to Tallahassee. Okay. Now, am I right in thinking the large pharmacy group there is... Something like CVC or... CVS. There's CVS. two, CVS and Walgreens. Yeah. Uh, so, CVS. So we go to CVS mm -hmm. early in the morning and we engage with the cashier as we're paying for our goods. Mm -hmm. And she obviously recognises our very strong uh, English accents, yes. or in Joan's case, a Scottish accent, mm -hmm. um, and says, what are you doing? We said, we're, we're driving through America, we're going to New Orleans... And we thought we'd stop off at Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. To which she replied, why would anyone want to stop at a dump like Tallahassee? Right. I quite like Tallahassee. Did you like Tallahassee? Yeah, I thought it was nice. They, they've got a, the Florida State University is based yeah, in yeah, Tallahassee. Yeah. Actually is quite an interesting college town. Yeah. So, yes, I don't think it's And we went around the, what would they call it, the Senate or the, mm -hmm. uh, it was a very impressive building. So Tallahassee is the capital yeah. of Florida. So each state has a capital, and and therefore each state has a home of government for yeah. it within that. So I think Tallahassee is a very nice place. If you hadn't done that drive before, I would be saying do the drive. Yeah. But given that you've done it, for, yeah. for anyone else planning a similar trip, don't fly between New Orleans and Tampa. Instead, do the drive and stop at Tallahassee, stop mm -hmm. at Biloxi, or you know wherever. Mobile? Have you been to Mobile? Um, Mobile? I've, Mobile, it's Mobile. called. Yeah, I have driven through it. I haven't yeah. stayed there. I think it's like a fishing community, isn't it, really? It's, it's a big uh, naval port. Naval so, port, so, yeah. yeah. But, but I think you mentioned earlier, you get a, a really strong feel for the, the southern architecture. You, right. you walk around the old town, and, it's, and it is a bit of faded elegance, but there's some beautifully preserved buildings, really nice. It's an argument about which is the most southern state, mm. and Alabama must have a very good chance of winning it. Anywhere in Alabama, you will pick up very quickly the uh, southern hospitality yeah. and the different ways of behaving. 
Have you been to the Everglades? No, so hence the reason we want to drive to Key West. Okay, so, well, a bit of geography first. So Florida, you've got the West Coast and all the beaches. And then at the bottom of, of that sort of Florida mainland, you then have Everglades. And then you have a road called Alligator Alley. Which I've been on. Yes, and so you go from the Everglades to Miami via Alligator Alley. But one of the things you can do in the Everglades, you can go on a a fan-propelled boat and go and see the things which live in the Everglades uh, swamps. Alligators. Uh, Didn't see a single alligator on Alligator Alley. Oh, alligators are really common in Florida. Mm. You don't play golf, do you? No. Pretty much every golf course, every pond or every lake in every golf course has an alligator in it. During mating season which I think is, I don't know exactly when it is. I think it's in spring. Alligators will travel a long way to do their stuff. Actually, I saw a video the other day, and interestingly, it was outside a CVS, where a woman came out out of the CVS, and then saw on coming out of the CVS an alligator. And she moved quickly. (laughs) I mean, what I don't know whether it was the medicine or the alligator, uh, but she moved really quickly. And then you see the police come with their alligator catching equipment to take the alligator somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, do stop at the Everglades. It's a great place. You're going to go to Miami? Um, Probably. Again, a little bit like LA, my wife will want to go. Right. um, And actually, Miami go on the beach because she likes the Art Deco. But we have now done that a couple of times. So she told me she likes shopping. No, you don't say. That's what she told Tell me. Tell surprise. I know less about shopping than I do Meghan and Harry. Miami would be a good place to do some shopping. So you just need to figure out where those shopping areas are, I suspect. In February in, in Florida, it's spring training. Mm. So all of these places, well, many places in Florida have bases for the uh, Major League Baseball sites. All down the West, there are, I don't know how many, there are about six or seven sides which have a base there. So you could go and see yeah. a game at spring. They're smaller stadia, but they're terrific. And they, they tend to be a little bit more relaxed because they really essentially are training, but a great place to see baseball, much more relaxed setting. So you're essentially seeing these baseball games, the, the larger teams playing in minor league baseball stadia. But one of the other things I think you should think of doing is go to a batting cage. Have you ever been to a batting cage? No, I've not done a batting cage. So they're pretty. you can find them pretty much most places. Uh, but certainly we have used them in, in the Miami area. You go to this cage, you get given your helmet, and you get given your bat. And then you take your tokens, and then you decide what speed of ball that you want to face. And what speed of ball did you face, Julian? Well... So there's two types. So you can have softball, which is the large ball, or you can have the baseball, which is the small ball. So assuming I was doing a baseball, if you start off with 40 miles an hour, I can hit most of the 40 miles an hour balls. Okay. So they, they're thrown by this machine and they throw it over the plate. So as long as you're not standing on the plate, this ball will come over the plate. It won't hit you. And then you try and hit it. And with a 40 mile an hour ball, you're going to hit most of them. With a 50 mile an hour ball, you're going to hit half of them. And with a 60 mile an hour ball, it'll just pass you before you've moved. <laughs> and then you realize for the major leagues that they're throwing that ball at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And you couldn't, or you're not hitting many 60 miles an hour balls. So some of the baseball batting cages go up to 70, but you're probably going to meet your level at. 50 or, or something like that. That's a great thing to do. And with your wife's strong interest in baseball, that'll be really fun. <laughs> I'm sure it will be, Julian. And then Key West, the key thing, open top sports. Yeah. Camera. And then go back to episode two and hear my advice. Given that you're staying somewhere, I strongly suggest you don't stay near Duval Street, which is kind of the noisy yeah. street. Stay a few streets away from there, either the northern part of the old town or the southern part of the new town. Lovely places to stay. This year, which was a, a COVID year, accommodation was very expensive. Comfort Inn, which is a relatively low quality motel, 
was $670 a night because people couldn't go to the Caribbean. It'll be cheaper, but it can get expensive. So, you know, make sure you sort of book up in advance there. Mm. But I'm looking forward to the drive, and you say I shall probably hire a Mustang and just right. drive down the road. Mustang, car of choice, rent it from Tampa, drive through to Key West. You probably, the drop off fee back to Miami wouldn't be too high. So. Okay. You're very knowledgeable on this subject. You know, <laughs> I can see you've done lots of thought about it. Well, I've been to these places. Yep. It's, uh, it's, it's easy. Julian, did you know at the moment you can't get a milkshake in McDonald's? I did. I saw the news last night. I don't go to McDonald's, so I'm not particularly put out by that piece of news. But I understand you can't get chicken in Nando's. You can't? Or KFC? And it's similar in the US. I don't think they've necessarily run out of milkshakes. But as we've been traveling up and down the country, what we have noticed is that every store is advertising for workers. It is quite unerring. Many restaurants are not opening for lunch because they do not have the staff. They are closing early or they're operating on uh, more limited menus than normal. Uh, You cannot get a contractor to work any element of your house. Uh, So very few things are being built. Companies aren't quoting. Things aren't being delivered. We were at a place recently in South Carolina and it had well water. So they, they delivered bottled water. And there were eight days in a row where this bottled water was supposed to arrive. And every day we had an email saying, you know, due to staff shortages, we weren't able to deliver that water. And there are over 10 million open jobs that are known about by the Department of Work in the US, a very large number of open positions. The most worrying thing is that daughter number two has found a job. Never. No, it's unbelievable. No. Things are so bad that somebody has even offered her a job. And they're offering sign-on bonuses as well. So, But I, th- I think, Julian, mm. when you say daughter number two had found a job, I think father number one... Father uh, number one, it's true. So this is how the opportunity. So this is how it went, yeah. So I was moving my children out of their university accommodation. I needed temporary storage. So we went along to the storage area, which also rents out vans and lorries and things. And I was talking to the owner and I said, Oh, how was it to you know to get staff? And she said, It's terrible. I've never known anything like it. And daughter number two is standing alongside me. And I said, My daughter's looking for a job. And the woman looked at her less than a second, and then said, when can you start? Daughter number two said, how much are you paying? And the minimum wage in the US is $8.25. Actually, it's a little bit less for for younger people. She was offering $12 an hour. And she says, if you stay a day, then I'll give you a $100 sign-on bonus. If you stay a week, I'll give you an extra $300 sign-on bonus. Daughter number two gets a job you can tell that things are pretty desperate. And wages generally have gone up. So I think Walmart is now paying $17 an hour. It wasn't that long ago that everyone was decrying them for only paying minimum wage. How is it in the UK? Well, interesting you talk about water shortages because right. <laughs> uh, we're experiencing the same thing. The major supermarkets getting water is difficult. We, we've got that situation here. Is it... COVID related, right. is it Brexit related? So okay. in terms of the water shortages, the Road Haulage Association says currently there is a shortage, 90,000 HGV drivers, right. people driving these big trucks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This was reported in the BBC. Indeed, they said something like 25,000 of these people had gone back to the EU. And if you say HGV is a semi-skilled job, it's, it's an interesting because... So, But you were a big Brexit supporter, weren't you? <laughs> Absolutely not, Julian. You know, you're being controversial. So, so I have to say, um, and it was pointed out to me the day that we were talking about Afghanistan and immigrants coming to the UK, and I then checked what he said. He said, look, uh, do you know of a million people have left the UK? Now, according to The Guardian, 
Over a million people since Brexit have left the UK. Okay. So what were these people doing before they left? We already know some were HGV drivers. Right. We know we, these were the people who were picking out fruit. Mm-hmm. These were the people who were waiting on us in, in restaurants and, uh, right. and, and, and cafes, etc. So we experienced exactly the same situation that you outlined. That indeed, I went walking on Sunday with some friends, had booked the restaurant for lunchtime, and on Saturday night, around 7pm, I got the message, your booking has been cancelled. Right. Um, as we walked, I did successfully rearrange it, thankfully, but uh, elsewhere, but as we walked past the, the restaurant, what did it say? We've got a uh, shortage of staff, and the staff we've got have been notified of COVID. So, uh, so, so this pingdemic. Yeah. So, so, so actually, do you want to explain to American listeners what a pingdemic is? We've invested in the UK in, in, in a very sophisticated track and trace system, which for the probably the first 50% of COVID didn't work at all. Right. Had, and then all suddenly it started to work and work too successfully because it would identify had you spent 50 minutes within 250 metres of somebody who's infected. So it does this through your mobile phone? Yeah, through your mobile so phone. So it yeah. identifies if you and I both have our yeah. mobile phones with us, yeah. and then one of us tests positive for COVID, then it would then tell me it that I ping. had... It would ping me. Yeah. And, and it would tell me that I had to isolate. Immediately. For how long? Well, uh, up to, I think I'm going to say, 12 days. Okay. But it's So I'm not ill... No. And I can even test negative for COVID, but I still have to isolate. I have to isolate. Mm-hmm. And it's a little strange because on the case I got pinged, I was pinged on the seventh day. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't need to do the whole tw- 10 days, okay. just the three days. Okay. But equally, my wife who was living with me was allowed to go out. It was a little strange, okay. but of course the numbers escalated right. and eventually we got the sign say, switch your phones off. Don't you know? Because right. otherwise the whole nation was going to be pinged and not been able to work. So, so consequently, we still got this problem and, and now they're relaxing the rules that no, you don't have to isolate if you get pinged. So you've got the same sort of issues with the shortage of people, yes. but and there are different theories about what is causing it. Some people say it's caused by COVID regulations. Some people say it's caused by Brexit. Are there any other things that are reasons that are given? I'm going to refer you back to your days with the Bank of England. Oh, yes. Are you ready? Do you yeah, remember, yeah, yeah. Do you remember structural unemployment? Uh, I do, yes, yes. And do you want to tell our listeners what structural un- unemployment is? I believe structural <laughs> unemployment is people are, who are just so rubbish that they can't ever get a job. I, I think that's a little harsh, but <laughs> let me, let me uh, give it more detail. It basically says that if you're a shipbuilder yeah. in Newcastle and you're no longer building ships, right. you're unemployed. Right. Or let's take the coal miner trying to dig up coal when the pits are shut. Right. So, so, so people who have skills, but there's no demand for those skills. Yeah. That's really what yeah. structural yeah. employment is. And, and yeah. what I think we've yeah. got, Julian, is somewhat quite perverse in mm-hmm. the sense that we've suddenly got vacancies... And people not wanting to do the jobs. Right. So, and I'm, and, and I'm going to take it down the path. And I know on the podcast we're talking a lot about education. But you see, I think what we're seeing here is a lot of the people who would have gravitated to those jobs, at least either temporarily or permanently, are now going on to higher education. So what we've got here is something that people don't want to work in restaurants, don't want to pick food, don't want to even be an HGV driver. Um, and if you look at the numbers... Something like 728,000 students applied to go to university. Right. So I'm thinking what we've got is we've got jobs which are relatively semi-skilled or people don't want to, you know, could easily go into, but they're choosing not to go into them. And, and that consequently, it was okay why we were part of Europe or, or we'd got mass immigration because people were coming into those jobs. Now we don't have the same level of traction. We've got this death, mm. i.e. we've got vacancies. But we've got people who don't want those vacancies. Right. What do you think? Well, I don't know about the UK. I know in the US that people are somewhat flummoxed by the fact that there aren't enough workers to do the work. And there are lots of competing theories about what is causing it. Similar to your Brexit example, some of these arguments are politically motivated. 
So an argument by many Republicans is that the main reason for this shortage of workers is that there are a whole range of people who are being paid unemployment. That argument sounds good until you realize that at least half the states aren't paying any unemployment. They also have shortages. You would assume that if that was the reason that there would be shortages only in the states which paid unemployment. And so I think that's a little bit like your Brexit example. You have people who put forward arguments because it is in accordance with their own political beliefs. I think there are 6.1 million fewer Americans in the workforce than there were at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think a big cause of this is COVID cautiousness. There are a bunch of people who really are so concerned that they might get COVID that they are not willing to work in jobs which are alongside other people. And I think there's an addendum to that one. In some areas, children haven't been going back to school. I think there are mothers and some fathers who are not going to work because they have to care for their children in the home, because they have to help them with their schoolwork in the home environment. So I think those are two significant factors. There have been no legal immigrants coming into the US over the last year. Certainly in some places, a lot of their workers are seasonal workers who are immigrants. So we were at a restaurant in Delaware and uh, Rehoboth Beach. We were talking to the staff there who were massively overworked. uh, And they said, well, usually we have a whole bunch of people from Eastern Europe who come over and do these jobs for the summer. uh, And they could get something called a J visa. And we haven't been able to get that this year. And so that's why we're not opening at lunchtime today. That's the immigration mm-hmm. one, which which has a big effect in, in the US. I think another major factor is a lot of people in America have more than one job. They have two, three jobs sometimes. If, um, Walmart is paying you $17 an hour and they want as much of your time as, as they can get. There's no need for you to do a second or third job. Where people were doing something as a second or third job, they're not doing that anymore. And the bigger, larger corporations, they're getting their workforce, but the smaller companies, they're not able to get that. They possibly can't afford to increase their wages to $17 an hour because their customers won't bear that price increase. So there's a whole range of reasons. Also, there's probably a few older people. Americans tend to work until they die. And they, you know, they struggle to retire. And maybe the pandemic enabled some of them to see that retirement was quite good. So maybe some of those older ones left the workforce as well. I think it's a whole combination of reasons. And I would imagine that all of them, to an extent, contribute to why there are no workers. And what about mobility, uh, Julian, in terms of, if I say there is clearly a certain amount of structural unemployment in the UK, and I made reference to shipbuilders and coal miners. But if we take things like, not only people don't want to pick fruit, but to pick fruit, you've got to come to the southeast. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's no good being in the northeast because you haven't got the fruit to pick. Is that a a, a similar issue there in terms of where there is available labour, it's away from where the job is being done? I've got two comments to make. A lot of mobility in the US is formed by, but they're not being a good opportunity where you live and they're being a great opportunity elsewhere. When pretty much all the states are looking for employees, there's no need for you to leave and go somewhere else unless you want to. That mobility has probably reduced. However, I have met a couple of nurses in our travels and nurses in particular are in extremely high demand, particularly in ICUs. And some of the nurses with that experience are finding that they can get a contract for two or three months in North Mm -hmm. Dakota, and they are being paid enormous sums of money for them for those contracts, maybe $100,000 for two or three months' work. In time of COVID, you, you can't not have nurses. So their salaries have just gone through the roof. And so many nurses have left where they normally live, and they are becoming itinerants and will go to whoever will give them the highest paid contract. And that's very similar to the UK, Julian. The NHS mm-hmm. has filled about 100,000 vacancies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we've traditionally relied on non-British immigrants uh, very significantly. So right. something like 30% of the total workforce 
is non-British immigrants. And indeed, when it comes to doctors, that's 28%. So you can see um, that's a real issue in healthcare because with huge shortage right. of, of, of what are skilled and highly trained professionals. Right. And if you're running a hospital during a pandemic, you can't not have yeah. doctors and nurses. And I've met two of them myself, nurses who are really in the space of a couple of months being able to earn maybe two years of normal salary. So they are just going between different places, just maximizing their income, building up those savings, enabling them to have a bit of flexibility, you know, later on in their life. And what about the public sector? Is that suffering from the same number of <laughs> jobs? Uh, or, uh, dare I say, it, are those jobs of a nature that people are very happy there and don't move? I mean, uh, we, what we've said really so far, a lot of these job shortages are in hospitality, in retail, right. and in logistics. What about the public sector? I've got a few observations. So one of the things which happened since the pandemic started is that everyone has, whenever you phone up someone, you know, like a call centre, there's always this message which says, or oh, during this difficult time, we've had issues and we're not able to offer our normal service. And the normal service for public sector is usually pretty terrible. And then you're kept waiting for an hour while you, or maybe more, while you wait for somebody to answer the phone. That would indicate that they probably have some staff shortages, but might also indicate that they it's an excuse for them to deliver poor customer service. If you're looking for electricity, you can't go somewhere else for your electricity in most places. So possibly just spend a little bit less money on it. I don't know. Okay. Are they looking for staff? Yeah, they probably are. Because if you can earn more money somewhere else, then people will. many people will just take that opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you don't get the sense here that there's the same job shortages in the in the public sector. Indeed, I, I think talking about mobility and people moving for higher rates of pay, the vast majority of public sector workers stay within the sector mm -hmm. uh, and, and do so because obviously the pension provision. There's a there's, right. once you're there, you don't you don't move. Well, the same in the US yeah, is yeah. job security and yeah. pension provision is and public service. They're the things which make people want to work in the public sector. When we became citizens, the time frame for our citizenship extended massively. We never re were really quite sure why that was or what indeed those people were working on it were doing if they weren't progressing our citizenship and other people's citizenship applications. So looking ahead, mm. your crystal ball, what, what, <laughs> what do we think is going to be the outcome of this, say, in 12 to 18 months' time, Julian? My view is high inflation as companies pass on the increased labour costs onto their customers. So that will be one big implication which will probably raise interest rates, which will cause all sorts of effects on the economy. I don't think that wages in places like Walmart will go down. So I do think there's going to be a very positive effect on the numbers of people in poverty, because I think, I think it will be the norm for low-skilled jobs to pay them much higher sums of money. I think that people will recognize that immigration is important again. I mean, immigration is instrumental to the US. It is what defines the US. It's what built the US. And I think that the arguments in favor of immigration will be more palatable to people in the future. You know, if you can't get your rubbish collected or you can't get your water delivered, then at some point you, know, you might want some people who want to do those jobs. So, yes, I think some of those are implications. What do you think about in the UK? I think we are going to experience food shortages or have less choice mm -hmm. for, a, for a long time. I, like you, think that will impact on it. Ultimately, the rules of the game will change and we will have more immigrants coming back into the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, milkshakes will return. You're a big fan of milkshakes. And we like a strawberry milkshake. Do you? Yeah, strawberry is definitely one I would never choose. <laughs>
categorizing individuals by one feature of their personality and ignoring any complexities or contradictions of their character. Nevertheless, most of us do it, including teenagers. We may think we know high school cliques from every American movie and TV series, but are they true? First, here's daughter number one describing each clique. We have to start with typical American movie. You've got the, the jocks, the football players, the cheerleaders who okay. run in one clique. You've also got the group that I was part of, which is more the nerdy crowd. We got along with everyone because everyone wanted homework answers, but okay. weren't intentionally invited things. Right. You've also... So you, if there was a party, they wouldn't invite people who were nerds? Probably just because you didn't have a m- much interaction with them on a daily basis. Okay. Streaming also hurt that. It meant right. that if you were not in classes with any of the jocks because they were in the lower streams because they either don't work as hard or they weren't as bright, they probably weren't going to invite you to anything because you didn't know them very well. Right. Then you've got the musical kids. The musical kids are the band kids, the chorus kids, kind of intermingles with the theatre crowds. Okay. I was also friends with a lot of people in the theatre. Mm-hmm. You have the goth emo group. There weren't many at my school that I knew about. I, mm-hmm. I can imagine. A I lot think of them aunt were... number one may have been a goth. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is only one aunt though. <laughs> well, that's right. Why is there aunt number one? <laughs> we only have one aunt. <laughs> Daughter number two thought that her elder sister had missed out on a key group. Stoners. Stoners, okay. That's, that's definitely... That's so stoners definitely... are a, a group, they're different from the outcasts? 100%, because okay. most of them were extremely popular. Unlike her sister, daughter number two struggled to place herself in any particular group. So which group were you in? Um, The normal people. No, we didn't have a normal group. Well, we had the, jocks, nerds, but that's not. But I wasn't. kids, theatre... But, okay, then I guess you could consider me a nerd, but most of my... But I i don't know. I guess I didn't really fit into any of those. Okay. But I think a lot of my friends also didn't fit into any of those. This hesitancy may discredit the idea that cliques are as all-defining as they are in the movies. People, even teenagers, are complex and fit into more than one box. Maybe, as in real life outside school... High schoolers make friends with people they spend a lot of time with and won't necessarily go out of their way to expand their group of friends. Despite misgivings on how people are put into boxes, daughter number one believes that there is a clear ranking of these cliques in a high school environment. The popular people were the top of the pecking order. And the popular people are the jocks. So for boys, it almost always correlated to sports. For girls... It didn't so correlate to sports. It was more about what you wore to school, what kind of car you drove, things like that. So how pretty and how rich you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. But jocks, you could be very popular and not have a car, probably. Okay. The theatre kids, the nerds and the band kids and that middle tier. Okay. And then you've got the people that don't really socialise with anyone. So goths, emos, people who didn't go out of their way to have any interactions with any of the other people. And the school shooters come from which group? They don't have one. Everyone at high school, there usually is a group where everyone can fit in. They come from a non-group. They don't believe they're understood by any one group of people. And in fact, a lot of times they fixate on the idea of groups and that they're not included. I asked daughter number two, which group was at the top of the social hierarchies? Probably your classic jocks and popular kids. Anybody that dated somebody in that circle would be considered... You missed out popular kids. Popular kids, okay. But like anybody... Or were you a popular kid then? No, but that's because I stopped caring. I feel like in middle school I was because I was in that really weird friend group. But I just decided that I hated them all when I went to high school. (laughs) So I had five friends. But my five friends were great and they weren't they didn't conform to any of those groups and we were all pretty different like some of our friends were theater kids Mm -hmm. and some of our friends were cheerleaders Uh, cheerleaders are definitely within the jocks group aren't they yeah yeah so jocks and cheerleaders they're at the top is that right yeah then it would just be the regular crowd and And then then it would be the i Honestly, 
I would then it would probably be the stoners, and then it would probably be the outcasts, just because they got a lot of press for the things that they did. So give me an example of a, an outcast. They would have zero problem getting in trouble in class. They would always talk back to the teacher. Just, just like kind of an asshole, to be honest. They would skip school, never show up, do drugs, be high in class, get drunk at school, do whatever it was, vape in the bathroom. Because you would assume like the bad kids, the outcasts, the jocks were the ones doing the most bad stuff at school, but they were also friends with the administrators and the campus police officer. The campus police officer was actually friends with most of the people that dealt drugs at my school. He was friends with all of them. So, what have we learned from this episode? Probably that the categorization of teenagers into groups does exist and that there is some sort of accepted hierarchy. However, we have also probably learnt that the simple depiction of these groups in movies and TV shows is an oversimplistic concept designed to contain the narrative into an easily understood, bite-sized piece. Incidentally, some British listeners may be surprised by daughter number two's mention of the high school police officer. Almost all American high schools have them, we will learn more about their role in a future episode. We've come to the end of our 10th episode. As always, we very much welcome uh, feedback. I'm going to name check Scub28, Ian Barnes and Georgia Hill. And Georgia commented vis-a-vis the conversation we had around US and uh, English and English English and indeed going into a local gas station and making reference to the garage as opposed to the garage. Thank you very much Georgia, Ian and Scoob28. Continue to send us out feedback and we'll see you next time. Well hold on before we go Ian Barnes said shame you couldn't get Michael to sing Chattanooga Choo Choo. You now, uh, missed that bit, Michael. I did, Ian, and I suspect that you were done. This was done with the bidding of Julian, who is keen <laughs> to get me singing on the podcast. <laughs> Remember, we had um, uh, what was the other one? The Glenn Miller uh, song we sort of talked about. What was that? That, that is. Chattanooga yeah, no, there was, a, and there was another one, wasn't there, Julian? What was that? I don't know. What What is it you'd like to sing? No, no there was. <laughs> I was trying to get you to sing, remember? Oh, yeah. But anyway, Ian, thank you for, for your, your, your comments. Keep sending them in. And at some point I may well sing, but it won't be Chattanooga Choo Choo. I had some feedback from Judith Knox. Uh, she loved the podcast and she wanted to know what the music was that we played. Uh, and the music, Judith, is Hosed Down. And it's by Emiliano Patrick Legato. So that's where the music comes from. Thank you for your kind comments and your question. So next time on the pod, we're going to look at drug advertising. Uh, I'm always interested to know uh, what's the maximum number of side effects you can get by buying um, drugs in America, which is great. We're going to go to Nashville. So uh, we may return to country music. Mm -hmm. uh, Excellent. and And Julian, you're going to talk about... I'm going to talk about sports and music in US education. Okay, so until next time, thank you for listening. Yeah, see you soon. And which one would you be a party to if you were at high school now, Julian? Oh, I would have been a nerd. We'll leave it at that then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you probably would have been a school shooter. School shooter. School shooter. School shooter. School shooter.